Good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Please stand and worship with us. Grace, hope you guys are doing well today. Um, I learned the hard way. I need to put suntan lotion on because I got some burnt, burnt yesterday uh, from uh, some water Olympics and the day before. But welcome if you're a guest. There's a perforated section in the bulletin. If you would tear that off, 
And in the back in the sanctuary and in the front by Randy was handing them out in the, in the uh, gym. That's your offering to us today. And let's pray and we'll continue to worship. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. Lord, I just pray that, that we remember that every day. And we live, live like that as well. It's, through, it's by grace we've been saved. Lord, and uh, I just pray that you uh, bring the word through Jamie. Lord, just speak through him and let it convict our hearts and apply it to our lives. And I just say it's in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you saved my soul. scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 34, verses 17 through 19. Listen to these encouraging words from the psalmist. He says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all.
seated. If you would open to Mark chapter 6, this morning we'll be in verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> Mark 6, 1 through 13. Pray.
perhaps you have at your front door at your house a welcome mat. Something that lets people know when they arrive at your home that they are welcome to be there. Uh, even if you are an uninvited guest, you want them to know that you are happy to see them. And so you put out what's we, uh, what we call, of course, a welcome mat. Now I want you to imagine you go up to a house and it has unwelcome mats. Some of these cracked me up. I know you can't read them well, so let me read them to you. One of them says, oh no, not you again. Another one just says, leave. Another one says, go away. And my favorite one, bottom right, says, there is no reason for you to be here. Okay, those would be what we would call unwelcome mats. So you go to a front door. What would you do if you saw this? Would you knock? Would you ring the doorbell? Would you walk away? It would be kind of an odd feeling, especially if you're showing up unexpected. You know, is this a person that really doesn't like unexpected guests? There may have been a time in your life when you were in maybe some kind of group setting and you actually felt unwelcome. You could just sense uh, by the tone of, of what was going on around you that you were not wanted there at that time and you felt unwelcome. Or maybe somebody just made it clear to you by saying, I don't want you here. You're not welcome here. And they made it very clear that you are not welcome. That can be, of course, hurtful and unsettling, but it can happen. It's going to happen more often in the future when it comes to us as followers of Jesus sharing the gospel. We desire to be welcomed. We desire to at least be able to have conversations with people about Christ and the gospel. But more and more, we are going to be shown the unwelcome mat. People who say, we don't want you here. You're not welcome here. I don't want to hear this. I'm not interested in what you are saying. So when it comes to trying to share the gospel, we are going to be shown the unwelcome mat. We see this today in our text. We're actually going to look at two different texts, but I think carrying along the same theme in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Up to this point in Mark, Jesus' ministry has been centered outside of his hometown in Capernaum, but now he travels back to his hometown, Nazareth, which is about 25 miles from where he's been ministering, and he's with his disciples, presumably to do the same thing that he's been doing in other areas, coming in starting to teach, starting to minister to people, do miracles, and preach and teach about the kingdom of God. And it's displaying these great works. But now he is back in his hometown. So if you'd please stand, I'll be reading Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. It says that Jesus went away from there. This is right after he had, immediate, he had healed Jairus' daughter, or raised her from the dead. He went away from there and came to his hometown... And his disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and jo Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household." And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And then Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. You can be seated. So during Jesus' earthly ministry, both he and his disciples experienced rejection when they preached the kingdom of God and performed great miracles. Despite the evidence that surrounded Jesus of his uh, messianic title and the reality of who he actually was, he still experienced rejection, and his disciples who spoke in his name also experienced rejection. So in our mission to take others to Jesus, we are going to experience the, the painful reality of rejection. The first main idea I want you to see here is that despite the evidence of Jesus' identity and power, the gospel and we will be rejected. Despite the overwhelming evidence of Jesus' identity and power, the gospel and thus us who carry the gospel will be rejected. There's two parts I want you to see here. First, I want you to see that the evidence surrounding Jesus and his followers is obvious. And then second, the rejection still exists. 
Let's look at the obvious evidence of who Jesus is. The evidence of Jesus being unique was beyond anything that anybody had ever seen. And that is not disputed, and it's still not disputed. The uniqueness of Christ. What is disputed is who He is, but the uniqueness of His life, the uniqueness of His ministry, the uniqueness of how He has changed the world in a way that no other person has changed the world, that is not debated. Even at the end of Matthew, the religious leaders of the time did not debate His resurrection. They simply made up a lie to excuse it. Look at verses 1 and 2 here as we get into the scripture we're looking at today. It says that Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. And they said, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hand? So here and throughout through Jesus' life there were two broad categories in which Jesus was unique. Two broad categories that distinguished him. And the first was his teaching. It says in verse 2 that those who heard him were astonished. And they said, where does this man get these things that he's teaching? And, and where does he get this wisdom? They'd never heard anything like this before. This is similar to what we saw in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus is teaching. And it says that he taught with authority. And that he taught as one who had authority beyond what anybody had ever seen. And an understanding beyond what anybody had ever heard. So his teaching distinguished him. He stood out as a teacher. Secondly, what made him stand out was his mighty works. Which we, would, which we have seen in Mark thus far included healing, casting out demons, and last week even raising someone from the dead. And then, So they continued in verse 2 after talking about his teaching and said, How are such mighty works done by his, his hands? Who is this man that teaches like this and can do the things that he does? Now, skipping to the next block of scripture we looked at. In verses 7 through 13, let's see the, the evidence of the disciples and their uniqueness as followers of Jesus. We read verses 7 through 13 again. It said, He called the twelve, and they began to send them out, or He began to send them out two by two, and He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So, so they went out and proclaimed what, that, that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who had been sick, and they healed them. So within these verses, I want to point out three ways that dis, the disciples that the disciples distinguished themselves as followers of Jesus. And first was they obeyed his instructions, even when it did not make sense. They were told to not take things that you thought if you were going on a trip you should take, or you might even call essentials. And Jesus said, no. Don't take what you think you need to take. Just take a tunic and, and, and a staff and just, and just go. Okay? You, don't, you don't need to take everything that you think you would take. And that's what they did. So even though it may not have made sense to them at the time, they obeyed. Second, they preached the same message he preached. They did not change the message. It says at the beginning of Mark, Jesus came repeating, preaching repentance for the sake of the kingdom of God. And here it says they also preached that people should Repent. So the message stayed consistent. They were just preaching the same message that, that Jesus had been preaching all along. And then third, they did mighty works in his name, just as Jesus did mighty works, casting out demons and, being, and healing the sick. So their ministry basically mimicked Jesus' ministry. It looked exactly like his. So when the disciples showed up on the scene, it was very possible that people, even in places they had never been, that who'd heard about Jesus knew who these men were based on what they had heard about Christ and what he had taught because they sounded like him and they looked like him and they did the things that he did. All right, so I've been around a while now in ministry and I have seen uh, pastors and I hear them preach and I can tell you by, by, by how they preach who they're reading and who they're listening to. And you might be able to with me as well, I don't know. But I can tell you who their influences are, and I can tell you uh, who they're reading, not just on the words they say, but also their style, you know, how they pronounce certain words. Why? Because they're mimicking this ministry of this other person. And this is what the disciples were doing. They were mimicking Jesus. They, they distinguished themselves as Jesus' disciples. So the evidence that Jesus displayed pointed to his uniqueness and identity, and the evidence that the disciples displayed 
also pointed to Jesus' uniqueness and identity. And so there was a distinctiveness, distinctiveness among them that could not be denied. Now, as you carry on in Scripture, this perhaps culminates best and is most clearly seen when the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, where His disciples all of a sudden in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 24, and I'm not going to read that today, but if you'll remember, the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples. They start speaking in tongues, which is they begin speaking in languages of the people that were represented there and sharing the gospel in their own language in a miraculous way. The same message that Jesus has preached now they're preaching. Then they begin to see, you have these signs of miracles that take place. And so this, this uh, following the ministry of Jesus continues into the book of Acts, where they're preaching the same message, they're doing the same, they're doing the same thing, and they're being obedient to Christ. And then the evidence from Jesus' followers continues even today, if not most in the same way that it did with the disciples. For example, how, what do you know about Jesus' followers. Well, Jesus' followers obey him. That's how, we, that's how we know we're Jesus' followers. We obey him. Jesus said himself, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. We obey him. We stay true to his word. We preach the same message he preached. We still preach to people, repent, turn from yourself and your sin, and turn to Jesus Christ in faith. And we do good in his name, not to try and earn our salvation or upkeep our salvation, but in an effort of, of appreciation to show what Christ has done for us. In society, our calendars are marked by Jesus' life, B.C. and A.D. He still has millions of followers, and all he was from a historic standpoint was a poor carpenter, a nomad who was crucified with criminals. And many believe his resurrection was a fairy tale. And yet, he has millions and millions of followers and is gaining more every day. Santa Claus is not this popular, all right? So he's done what nobody else can do. There's the evidence of changed lives by Christ and through, through him. So the evidence for Christ through his own legacy and through the legacy of his followers historically and even today through the legacy of his followers is obvious. You might be able to word it like this. People cannot dispute the fruit. That's an original. Write that down. People cannot dispute the fruit. There was no disputing that Jesus was unique. There's still not disputes Jesus is unique. Liberal scholarship even doesn't dispute the uniqueness of Christ in a sense that he did things that no other person has been able to do. They dispute his identity, but they don't dispute him as a major, if not the major, world historical figure. So there is plenty of evidence to prove who Jesus is, and yet you still have the rejection of the gospel. In Mark, we've already seen the rejection of Christ by many people, including religious leaders, other people who witnessed his power and feared him. For example, the people who witnessed him heal the demon-possessed man who had been living in the caves, and they asked Jesus to leave. And even his own family, we see Jesus rejected. And now we see the rejection continue in verse 3. It says, the people said to Jesus in his hometown, Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And then it says they took offense at him. So despite recognizing his incredible abilities to teach, despite recognizing he was doing things nobody else had ever been able to do, they reject him. They say, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Okay, which many actually believed when they said that was an insult the son of Mary, because they didn't say the son of Joseph, because Jesus in his hometown may have been considered an illegitimate child. And then they say, is not his brother James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And we know his sisters, they're, they're here with us. So many of these people perhaps watched him grow up, and to them he would always be just Jesus, the carpenter of a poor, low, middle-class family, nothing special. And no matter what they did, they would never be able to move past that. The only high school reunion that I ever attended was my 10th high school reunion. Had I attended my 25th, I don't even think they had one. That would have only been about three years ago in 2018. would have been my 25th high school reunion. Now, had I attended a 25th high school reunion, when I got there, I would have finished all my education, had four children, one, of in, one in college, been married nearly 25 years, and been in ministry almost 20 years. And I promise you, when I showed up, the only way I would be remembered is Jamie, who lived out in the boonies 
and was the class clown. All right? That's, that's all they And they would have brought up all these stories, and I could have said, but listen, man, I've got multiple degrees now, and I've been married almost 25 years and four children. Let me tell you. And they'd be like, that's great. That's all fun. But you were still the class clown. I remember, I remember what you did, you know, and there would just be no way to shake that off. And that's kind of what was happening here with, with Jesus. Verse 3 even says they took offense at him. So they know he's not just teaching and performing miracles. Here's what they know, that he is purposely setting himself up as unique and above them. And now they're starting to think, who is this guy? He's a nobody. I don't care what he's doing. I don't care what he's teaching. He's not any better than us. They begin to get offended because they could see that Jesus' preaching and teaching was elevating himself above them, and they were offended. And they rejected the idea that he might be in any way unique or special or different from them, which is exactly what happens in our culture today. Jesus is a great teacher. Jesus is a great philosopher. That kind of puts him on level with us because we're all gifted. Jesus says better than us. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is the God man. No, because that means he's better than we are. Yes, he's better than we are. He's better than everybody, infinitely better than everybody that's ever walked the planet. Well, here's what happens in verse 4. It says, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household because they had already rejected him. So he was rejected by those who were the closest to him. He had already again been rejected by his family. Now let's look at the disciples, what happened to them as Jesus sends them out. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. It says, when Jesus said, then Jesus said to them, whenever you enter a house and stay there, or stay, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So Jesus is telling them, listen, go in and try and set up base camp somewhere when you find a place to minister. But he's warning them, not everybody's going to accept you. You're going to run into cases where you, you talk to people and they're not interested in what you have to say. You just need to, to move on. So today, just as in Jesus' day, during his ministry and during the ministry of the apostles, no one minds the works of Jesus. No one minds the wisdom or teaching of Jesus. They don't mind the fact that he ministered to people. But Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the God in the flesh, that is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to know God, that Jesus, the complete and true Jesus, will be rejected by many. When you start insisting on the exclusive claims of Christ, and salvation only comes by repenting and putting your faith in Jesus Christ, that is where you will start to be rejected. So don't be surprised when it happens. This is what Jesus was telling his apostles. In fact, in John chapter 15, in the very context in which Jesus tells us that in him we will bear much fruit. If we will abide in him, we will bear much fruit. John 15, here's what it says in verses 18 through 20. After he, Jesus says, you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And that changes the way we start talking about abiding in Christ and the fruit of abiding in Christ because here's what you need to remember. That means that rejection, you being rejected for the sake of the gospel, is some of the fruit that is promised to be born by you being obedient to Christ. Rejection is fruit. Rejection is fruit. When somebody rejects you or rejects the gospel out of your obedience, that's evidence, that's fruit sometimes, that you are being faithful to Christ. So despite our best efforts to speak the truth of the gospel and to live it out in our own lives and to demonstrate Christ to others, no matter how consistent we are with Jesus' message and the way he treated people and, and teaching his truth, some are always just going to reject us. It's always happened and it always will. So what happens? What are we to do? Now, the answer I'm about to give you may surprise you, but it's in both of these texts. What do you do when you're rejected? We respond to consistent rejection by moving on. By moving on. Does this sound like giving up? It's not. I'll show you. But we're talking about an obvious and consistent rejection, and there comes a point where 
we move on from those who have consistently rejected the gospel. Let's see Jesus' reaction in verses 5 and 6 to his rejection. It says he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He was as surprised at their lack of faith as they were at what he could accomplish. And then it says he went out among the villages teaching. So he didn't do any mighty works there. He did a few things, but not near on the scale of what he'd done anywhere else. He healed a few sick people. Then he says he went out into the villages teaching. So he moved on. He began to start branching out into other areas, seeing who would be receptive to his message and his work. This is really sad. It reminds me of the entire town that rejected Jesus after the demon-possessed man had been healed. Seeing what he could do, they didn't care. They wanted him gone. When well, Jesus now goes to his hometown, they're not really interested in him. So he just basically in the last place with the demon-possessed man, he got in the boat and left. Here he just... He just moves along. Then look at what he tells the apostles in verses 10 and 11 again. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so instructions to them are this. Set up a base. Find someone who will receive your message and will allow you to work from there. But if there's people who will not receive you, don't spend a lot of time trying to convince them. Just move on. And your moving on will be a testimony against them, an actual visual demonstration that they have rejected me. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that we share the gospel with a person once and they reject it and we just write them off. The Bible says that's not what happens. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul wrote of the gospel as this way. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And the implication here is that sometimes, in fact, most of the time, it takes a person multiple times hearing the gospel before they come to faith in Christ. So Jesus is not saying, and, the, and what I'm saying here is not, you share the gospel with a person once, they reject it, or they don't come to faith in Christ, you just write them off and say, well, forget it, then they're never going to come to faith in Christ. And Peter, in, in Acts chapter 2, after he finished preaching his message, and people came to faith in Christ, there were more that haven't, and in verse 40 it says, With many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so for those who did not immediately accept the gospel in Acts chapter 2, Peter kept kind of imploring them in his preaching to accept the gospel. But I do want to point out a few things. The first is that just because you move on doesn't mean someone else won't continue the work. Just because you move on from sharing the gospel doesn't mean someone else will continue won't continue the work. That's why it says, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered. So it sounds like there were times where Paul planted the seed, he, he shared the gospel, nothing really happened. Apollos came along behind him and maybe shared later, and, it, and something did begin to grow, and then God gave the growth. At some point, God brought the person to faith uh, in Christ. All right. So don't when, when you say, I'm, I'm kind of moving on here, you're not giving up on the person. You may have realized I've done my part in their life. Somebody else may have to come along and, and pick up from, from here. Second, I think in this text, and what I'm talking about here, is hardened, sure rejection. Okay, similar to that of the first soil in the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, where there is no interest in all, the person is not even inquisitive, and they may even be hostile. And you just kind of back up and move on here. Now, third, in our context, and I think this is what I'm really getting at, by moving on, we probably need to think in terms of emphasis. In other words, where there is a majority, where is our majority of focus supposed to be? So Jesus is looking to ministry in his hometown long term. He sends his disciples out to tell them, put up a base to do ministry long term. So there are cases where we've expended a lot of effort and what I would call a lot of gospel intentionality on a person and we get no response. Nothing has changed. Well, then, it may be time to put our focus or our efforts elsewhere. It's not that we don't continue to pray for the person. It's not that if we get a chance to share the gospel with them or talk to them about Christ again, we don't do it. It's a matter of where am I putting my focus. I'm, I'm looking around to see where am I, where's my gospel intentionality. How do you justify, for example, spending years sharing the gospel with a neighbor who is yet to show any interest in Jesus, but then ignoring the dozens of other neighbors that you have never shared the gospel with. That's what I'm talking about. 
You spend months and years focused on one person over and over and over again. In the meantime, you're not sharing the gospel with anybody else. You've not branched out in any way to share the gospel with any others because you're so focused on this one person. It may be time to move on and start putting your intentionality somewhere else. It's like being given permission to fish in 12 different ponds. But you know this one pond has this one big fish. And you want to catch that one big fish. But he's elusive. You can't catch him. You've tried for weeks, months, years maybe. This one big fish that you know exists that you cannot seem to catch. And you spend all your time and all your effort there. You have 11 other ponds you can fish in. You say, well, those ponds don't have that one big fish. Maybe not, but you don't know what they have because you haven't bothered to fish in them. You haven't bothered to branch out. You haven't bothered to do something different. And that's not saying you can't go back to that pond every now and then and fish that pond and see if you can catch that fish. And maybe one day he bites. But to me, it sounds like a waste of time to concentrate on that one pond and ignore all these others that you have the opportunity to. To fish in. So I'm not talking about giving up hope forever. I'm not talking about writing a person off completely. I'm talking about what we see in this text, a strategy shift. It's a personal strategy shift, a point where you begin to look around and say, who else needs to hear? I've been obedient sharing with this person. I've been obedient sharing with this person. I've done about all I know to do at this point. So who else can I invest in? My door is always open to this person, but who else now do I need to turn my attention to? So if a guy comes to me, and let's say he's in his late 20s or early 30s, and I'm making this whole scenario up, okay, because I don't want you trying to guess who this might be because the person doesn't exist. But they come to me in their late 20s and early 30s. They said, they said Jimmy, I want to talk to you. There's this girl that I've been trying to date for years, and she hasn't really shown any interest in me. And I've given her gifts, and I've expressed my affection toward her, and I've done all of these things. And every year I recognize her birthday, and I say, well, well okay, stop right there. Years, and you recognize her birthday every year. How long has this been going on? I mean, how long have you been trying to woo this girl? Oh, since middle school. You know what I'm going to tell him? Brother, fish in another pond. <laughs> it's time to move on. I mean, you've done everything you know to do. Nothing's happening. She's given no inclination she's interested. Move along. Get fi Find somebody else to maybe... Pursue in some way, but I would I would probably move on now That doesn't mean at some point this girl can't come to her senses and decide. Oh, what do you know? You know he is for me, you know or that somehow in a Happenstance meeting they they run in each other somewhere and get to talking and something has changed But I don't think I would be doing him any favors by telling him, oh keep going. Oh, you got to focus on that one focus on that one Look, I just I don't think that's good advice. Now, I know that's kind of a trite illustration to communicate what I think is a very weighty truth, but I would challenge you with these questions. Who have you been investing in for Jesus' sake that has consistently rejected the gospel? You can say, I have shared the gospel multiple times. I have been a consistent witness before them. I have ministered to them. I have reached out to them. I have done everything I know to do. And then ask this question, who might you now need to turn your attention. Now, this does take some prayer and discernment, but the questions I think are legitimate. And the questions aren't easy because why do we typically focus on one person? Because somehow, for some reason, we care deeply about that person a friend, sibling, parent, spouse. We care deeply about their salvation. And it's hard for us to kind of move on because we feel like until I get this one down, I don't feel like I can give my attention anywhere else. Well, first of all, whether or not that person comes to faith in Christ, if you've been the consistent witness, that's really not up to you. That's between them and God. You can't make them believe. In fact, I would even argue they don't even need you anymore. I mean, in reality, if you've given them the gospel and you've told them what they need to do, they don't need you around to accept Jesus. They can do that without you there. They and the Holy Spirit can do just fine. All right, but I understand why we're, we hold these people so tight because it's care and concern. But let's remember also God's not, God's not biased. God doesn't care about them more than he does anywhere else. We do, anyone else. We do. That doesn't mean 
God does. And so remember, if you faithfully share the gospel with them, then you can start looking around and saying, okay, I'll be there for them. I'll share when I get the chance. I'm not going to ignore them. But when it comes to where my focus is, that might need to change a bit. And then as we move along, what do we do? We stay focused on the mission given to us. The context may change, but the mission does not. We move on, not discouraged. God is at work. He will continue to work through us. Look at the end of verse 6. It says, Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He just kind of did what he told his disciples to do. He dusted off his feet and said, I'll just go somewhere else. He always began with teaching. This is what he did. He showed up and started teaching in these other villages. He changed the location, but he didn't change the mission. Now look at his disciples in verses 12 and 13. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out demons and anointed many with oil who were sick, and they healed them. So their message is the same as Jesus's. Mark 1.15 says that central to Jesus' message was repent. It's also central to the disciples' message. There's no indication that they changed their message. There's no indication that they said, hmm, this person really isn't getting it. Maybe I need to tweak the gospel a little bit so they understand it. All you're going to do by tweaking the gospel, according to Galatians 1, is perverting the gospel. Okay? So you don't do that. You don't change the message. You don't change the mission. Sometimes you change the location. So there were times, obviously, disciples just said, you know what? This person's not interested. We'll move on and find somebody who is. It's easy for us to lose focus when we're rejected by others because it can be so fatiguing. It can be so tiresome to share the gospel over and over and with consistency and living a consistent life and wondering, is it even matter? Is it even making a difference? That's why I think Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not grow weary for doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Paul knew and the Spirit knows that we grow weary when we do good and when we don't see the results that we'd hope. But the promise that he gives us through the Holy Spirit and through these words is to be patient, to stay on task, will eventually see fruit. But you may have to broaden your horizons. You may have to start looking around for the new neighbors that have moved into the neighborhood because the neighbors that you've been talking to aren't showing any interest. The people you have been sharing the gospel with aren't really interested. So finding people who might be interested. It doesn't mean the other person won't come to faith in Christ. You've given them all they need. It doesn't mean that sometime later you might not get a chance to talk to them. Again, we're talking about focus and we're talking about emphasis. A few weeks ago, I was in my garage. It was one of the nicer days, <clears throat> late March or early April. And so I had the big garage door open. And I was moving some stuff around and straightening up. And a man comes up to me carrying a box. And he says, have you ever heard of Kirby vacuum cleaners? And I said, my brother, I said, I am not interested. I said, I can tell you right now, I am not interested. I appreciate what you're doing, but I am not remotely interested in having any conversation about a Kirby vacuum cleaner. And you know what he did? He smiled. He said, thank you very much. Have a good day. And he took his box and he went on down the road. Okay? Somewhere along the line, he's going to sell a vacuum cleaner. It ain't going to be to me, at least not, to, not that day, and not today if he comes by. But somewhere down the line, he's gonna, he, didn't get, he didn't get mad. He didn't lose his smile. You know, he didn't, he, he didn't berate me. He didn't hound me. When, as soon as I threw up the rejection, he said, okay, and he just dusted off his feet, and he moved on. There are people that make whole careers doing that and have over the years. Okay, why? They stay consistent. They move on. They don't take rejection personally. It just is what it is, and they continue. They've got a mission. They've got a task. They know their product. They know what they're trying to sell. Okay, we have a Savior. We know what He can do. We know who He is. We share with people. They reject. We move along with a smile. It's okay. Maybe some days back in the neighborhood, our vacuum cleaner has blown up, and I wave him down. Hey, you know... I'm, now I'm, I'm ready. Maybe it's another Kirby vacuum cleaner salesman, not him. But I go, hey, another guy talked to me or was trying to talk to me about this, and I wasn't interested. Now, now I'm, I, I may be interested. But he moved on. I'm not trying to say we're not compassionate. I'm not trying to say that we don't continue to share the gospel. I'm trying to say we don't ignore others who need to hear about Christ simply because we're being rejected by the few people we've always put our attention on. Move around. Talk to people. 
Form relationships with people. Reach out to people because they need to hear as well. If you bow your heads. A couple of real simple questions as we close today. The first one is what I've been asking, and that is who have you put your attention on? And maybe you can say, look, I don't feel like I've quite exhausted everything for this person. Well, okay. Is there something you haven't shared with them about the gospel? Is there some way you haven't ministered to them? I can't tell you when to move along. I can't tell you when to dust, the, dust your feet off and move on. I can tell you be obedient in that. There's others of you in here that say, look, I've been dealing with a person and they haven't come to faith in Christ. What do I do? I would say keep praying for them. Keep looking for opportunities to share. But I would say put your attention somewhere else. Okay, They've got what they need. You will not stand before God in any way guilty if you've been obedient to what, they, what God has called you to do in their life. You're not giving up on them. You're just saying, you know what? There's other people that need to hear, and I need to, I need to focus on them. I need to start looking around. If you're here and you've never put your faith in Christ, this may be the third or fourth or hundredth time you've heard the gospel or heard about Christ. Let me tell you, Jesus is unique. And he's not just unique because he did miracles and he cared for people and he's a fantastic teacher. He's unique because of what Paul said to Timothy. There is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. He is the only way to know God. He is the only way to be forgiven of your sins. There is no other truth. There is no other way. There is no equal to Christ. That's why part of your acceptance of faith in Christ is understanding Him as Lord. When you declare Him as Lord, you're not just saying, well, I'm making Him my Lord. You are declaring Him as, no, He is Lord. I recognize Him above all others. In the early church, with all the pagan religions out there, that claim to be equal and one just as good as the other, Jesus comes along and says, I'm better and greater than all of them. In fact, they're all false. I'm the only truth. And a person who put their faith in Christ was expected to grasp that. So you have to reject every other religious philosophy, belief about God, everything, and turn to Christ alone as the truth. To believe that he was God in the flesh, he was crucified on the cross, he was buried, he was raised from the dead, physically, literally raised from the dead. He spent 40 more days on planet earth than he ascended into heaven where he is alive today. He is the only one that can boast and claim that. That's why he's unique. You can still reject him if you want, but it doesn't change his uniqueness. It doesn't change the truth. It takes humility to say I've been wrong my whole life and Jesus is the only way. But that's the only way to know Jesus. It's the only way to be forgiven. Father, we need wisdom in when to move on. We need wisdom in when to focus on other people, to open our horizons to see others who need to know you and to not get too focused on people who may have rejected you for months or years. We're not giving up on them. We still pray for them. We still love them and hope for them. But you've called us to make disciples of all nations, all people. God, you are not biased. So in our in our task and our calling to be as you are, we must not be biased as well. Give us wisdom in when to do that. Wisdom in, in how to change our focus and who to focus on. Lead us to people who do want to hear, who are interested, who are open, and who will hear the message of Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd please stand. Yeah.
seated for just a moment. <clears throat> a few announcements. Actually, we have several to work through here, and then we're going in just a few moments to hear an update from our New Mexico mission team. First is, there is a business meeting on June 13th. Now, because of our schedule, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. The business meeting will be right after the service, but before Sunday school. So we'll give you the usual dismissal to get your children and things of that nature, and then we'll have to meet back in here for the business meeting. The agenda is in, uh, is in the bulletin. Uh, we'll do what we usually do, have a financial update, approved minutes. Uh, we'll also get a missions update. But there's two key things that we'll be looking to approve. One is just the leadership positions as we do every year for 2021 and 2022. We need to approve those. And also, there's going to be a recommendation uh, from the Building and Grounds Committee. Also, <clears throat> Eric will talk more about that as a treasurer, to have some extra money approved uh, for some pretty significant renovations that need to be done. All that will be explained then. Uh, so we've... we've we're going to do it with the money we have on hand, but because it wasn't budgeted, uh, we need the approval to do that. So you'll hear about all that in uh, that, that business meeting. There's a movie night and a ladies' night out coming up, ladies, for you, so be sure you get the details uh, out of your uh, bulletin there. Also, if there is a child you know or you're the parent of a child and in going into third through sixth grade, there is a camp opportunity called Super Camp Horrific, uh, June 21st to 26th. Leah Lindstrom has been involved in this ministry for many years. 
uh, and wanted to open this up to children in our congregation as well who may not have a camp opportunity this year uh, for that. So if you are interested, uh, Leah's contact information is in there. There's some information in the foyer. There are also scholarships available, but she would be the contact person. So be sure that you talk to her if you are interested in that. Also, you should have gotten an email about an upcoming uh, trip to Maranatha. We are now at the point now we are ready to start traveling to New York to do ministry uh, with Maranatha Baptist Church, the church plant we're sponsoring. We're looking at a trip from about July 31st to August 4th or 5th, specifically to help with a, a community event they have every year that helps support the police in the area, but there will also be other things that we can do at that time. They need at four to eight. Eight would be about perfect, so if that's a trip you're interested in, we don't have all the details yet. We don't have a, a typical cost yet, but Jaleesa may have an idea. Talk to Jaleesa Cantrell to get information regarding that trip. If you're interested, that's coming up soon. Say, yeah, I, I want to know about this so that she can start planning that, and we will get more information in the future. I wanted also just to conclude the emphasis on child care and preschool that we've done over the last uh, few, few weeks. You heard from a children's teacher, preschool teacher, uh, child care worker, uh, and our director for child care, uh, you heard from a mom uh, whose children have been through our preschool uh, and children's ministries, and then you heard from children themselves last week by video, both children who are in the children in the preschool ministry and who have been. I hope this has sort of maybe stirred some things in some of your hearts to get involved in these ministries. To just to be frank, children in preschool ministries are the hardest to find people to lead in those ministries. Why? It's very simple. It takes more effort. Uh, it's a sacrifice because a lot of times you are giving up your Sunday school class time for that. But I hope you heard from people about why it's so important and that might have stirred your heart. So the first thing I would say is thank you for all those who work in child care. Thank you for all those who are preschool and children's teachers. Thank you especially to Patty Durbin and Kristen Ogle who uh, do our preschool, who are our preschool and children's directors. To Heather King who does our uh, child care schedule. But to anybody involved, I wanted to say uh, thank you. I know when we talk to people, a lot of people will say it's not a convenient time. And I've heard people say, I've got kids, it's not a convenient time. I don't have kids, I don't know what to do. I've raised my kids, I'm done with kids. Well, if we use every one of those excuses, guess who we're going to have working with children and preschoolers? Nobody. Okay, we need people who are dedicated to children and preschoolers who can work with them, love them. Uh, so if you are interested, please, in any way, we certainly need child care workers. Uh, but even in teaching, see Patty Durbin or Kristen uh, Ogle, and I hope that this um, maybe stirred some things in your heart to maybe be more involved in that. And I'll also tell you as a church family to reach out to young families. The nature of churches is they get older if you don't reach younger families. It just happens because everybody else grows and gets older, but we need younger families to come in. So when I, in the sermon, especially this morning, as you talk about who do I reach out to that maybe I haven't reached out to, start thinking, especially in light of, of young families, people who have young children, uh, people who aren't involved in any kind of church congregation but might be interested uh, in that conversation. All right, I think that is it for me. At this time, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our group who went to New Mexico uh, to give uh, a report concerning uh, their trip to New Mexico, and then when they are finished, they will close in prayer. start seeing some film up here and I'd like to ask the guys that went with me to get up here and I want to say you know what we are a mission giving sending church can't say it about everybody but I can say it about us we've had mission trips to Sioux Falls South Dakota Belgium uh, Panama Dominican Republic uh, and now to Queens New Mexico and uh, it's just been a blessing to see what's going on in our uh, in our church, our, our cooperative program giving, our mission giving is uh, 13 or 14 percent, I don't know exactly. Our Christmas offering was, what, over $25,000. Our, um, our Easter offering was almost 14000 And, you know, not many churches, especially our size, are like that. So I want to say to you, welcome. Welcome to Inlow Baptist Camp. And that's not it, but you're going to see things along the way. I think that's probably a long Amtrak, uh, the, the route we took. So anyway, a camp that sits about 7,550 feet in elevation among the towering Doug firs and ponderosa pines and junipers and on and on I can go, uh, an area where we saw probably two herds of 20 de deer each herd there at camp itself. Can't hunt there. They're not even afraid of a gun there. 
They, they fire guns around the deer there, and, and they just stand there and look at you like you must be nuts. But anyway, we, we uh, went over to, uh, left here uh, to Galesburg, uh, Illinois, and got on Amtrak. And then from Amtrak, we went through uh, Missouri and Kansas and southern Colorado and on into New Mexico. And it was just amazing. We were met there by Barry and Becky, uh, who work up at the camp, and uh, went out and had some good Mexican food, the real stuff, not what you get around here. And uh, we enjoyed that. And then uh, uh, as we got there, we began on uh, Monday morning working. And Keith and I, the first thing we did was we planed wood. We used their brand new, brand new $2,200 planer, and uh, we made wood that looked a lot better than you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards, I tell you. Uh, do what? Heavier, too. Heavier, too. <laughs> it was a little bit green, but that's okay. We didn't worry about that. Anyway, and then uh, uh, Josh... Uh, our mechanics, Josh and uh, Keith here, they worked on the backhoe and all the lawnmowers and all the other mechanical stuff and got those uh, fluids changed out and filters done, and uh, that was good. And, and then we, the main job we, we did there, though, was to re replace, uh, refurbish, uh, yeah, these are nice pictures. I don't know. We haven't got to the camp yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue what these pictures are all about, but anyway. Uh, uh, Anyway, we left, we left uh, uh, the rest of them, Keith and I were working, the rest of them worked cleaning out this, uh, the shower building that hopefully we'll see along the way somewhere. And uh, uh, let's see, we, we painted the inside of it and refurbished the inside and trim off the outside, the fascia board and all. We, we put new fascia board, new trim, uh, and so forth. It was, it was an interesting time. Uh, we worked well together. We didn't try to, we didn't argue. Nobody killed each other. No fights. That's pretty good. No bad at all. And uh, so anyway, on Thursday, after we finished up painting the last building we painted, uh, we took off for Albuquerque and rode the second largest, longest tram in the world. Uh, took it up the Sandia Mountains. A Sandia means watermelon and the the Indians named it in and the right at the time in the afternoon when the sun hits it it turns pink and they called it listen it looked like a slice of watermelon so we went up the watermelon mountains from the top of that it's 10,378 feet 76 feet something like that you can see almost probably a quarter of New Mexico from the top of the Sandias and it was quite a trip the guys liked it uh, I've taken that trip many times I'm sure I'll take it many more and then we, uh, we drove, by, <laughs> drove by my old house. I just want to see where I grew up at. Anyway, I, that thrilled them, I'm sure. Then went, down, <laughs> went through Old Town, Albuquerque, and we got to see the, uh, uh, that a little bit. And then we went and ate uh, Mexican food again and enjoyed that. Um, we had a lot of fun together and uh, enjoyed working together. And uh, I think everybody that went wants to go again next year. And so, and by the way, Tom, I only took one nap all week. I want you to know that. Two weeks, two years ago, I, I, I took one every day, and they, they kind of played with me on that. But. Hey, when you get to be 82 years old, you'll be the same way. Anyway, but uh, these guys want to go back, and, and we're planning again next year, the first week of May, of doing it again. And it uh, uh, seemed to be a good time. This year we went by Amtrak. Uh, it was cheaper. We made the round trip for about 230 bucks, I think, something like that. And... Uh, uh, some of you have already said you want to go next year. Some of you that went two years ago want to go back. These guys all want to go back, Lord willing, and we're still around, you know. Uh, but we need a couple of ladies next time, so ladies be thinking about it. We need somebody to help us with cooking. That, that relieves the, uh, the camp manager. What would I say? Huh? What would I say? It was okay. Still we need a couple of ladies to do the cooking. Helps with the cooking. Uh, so the camp manager can work with us and, and direct us a little more. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, and, and uh, it's going to be years to come before we get the camp uh, up to where it needs to be. And uh, simply, we do it all for the salvation of children and youth uh, who attend camp and need Jesus. Uh, each year, a large number of folks come to know the Lord as our Savior, and uh, it just also what we do makes for a better camping season, a better camping time. Uh, Let's see, I was going to say, let's see, well, oh, uh, I won't, let's see, I've asked these guys to just kind of quickly share one experience they liked that was good, and uh, just to give you an idea that, let them say something.
Okay, I really enjoyed it this year. Um, seems like they've got a, they have a new camp manager and he has, seems to have a lot more invested in the camp. So he's got a bigger um, plans for what he wants to do with the camp. Um, so I think he's got, a long, he's got a long way to go, but I think with some more help, we can help him in that, the projects he wants to get done. Thanks. So uh, as you're seeing these pictures here, this is all from my perspective of the trip. I had over 800 pictures. I narrowed them down to about 700 to make this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also had to change the duration on how long the pictures were up from three seconds to one second because it was a 35-minute video. Um, so the, this, this trip for me, um, it, it was amazing. I haven't been out of Indiana in years uh, since I was in the Army. It was a nice little getaway for me. I loved working with the guys. Um, you really get to know your brothers when you're working with them. We didn't have any sisters go this time, but that was okay. Um, I think the best part of the trip for me was honestly, I got to shoot a shotgun for the first time. Uh, the cam manager, he's, he's a gun nut, just like all you country people and everything. And so we went out and got to shoot some skeet and everything. That was a great time. Um, it's beautiful out there. I've been out to Colorado before, but New Mexico, the mountains, the desert, all that is just beautiful. Uh, we got a lot done, had a great time together. And like Doug said, we didn't kill each other. It was, it was a great time. Uh, the fellowship was wonderful. Um, and Doug's a good leader, too. I think he works a bit much for his age, but he's still got it. So. Yeah, I'd just kind of reiterate what everybody else is saying. I just really enjoyed getting to go work alongside these guys. Uh, it's just nice to, uh, it seems like most everybody, I just kind of get to know you here at church and, and don't really get to know you. Uh, when you go on a mission trip, you have, really have an opportunity to roll your sleeves up next to these guys and really get to know them uh, differently than, than what you do at church. Well, for me, it was a long train ride. <laughs> 24 hours is a long time, but it was a very humbling experience and a very good experience. <laughs> well, just in finishing, I want to say thank you for praying for us. I know many of you did that. I appreciate that. We do. Thanks for your financial help because we were able to take the trip for nothing. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, the price was right. Uh, I want to say thank you to Kevin and Dawn for the use of their pickup truck. We took their pickup over and threw all of our luggage in the back. Otherwise, we'd have had to take two vehicles probably. And uh, anyway, that's about it. If you have any questions along the way, ask any of us. <laughs> yeah, we, we took... Uh, yeah, on the Shire building, we took all that, all the wood off, all the fascia board and everything else. And anyway, yeah, uh, uh, Evan got some experience. He got to get on top of a roof, which he wasn't used to. And he had to get on top of a ladder, which I don't think he's ever done that before. And, uh, but he was a trooper. Everybody did a good job. And I just want to say thank you to these guys and thank you for you. And uh, anyway, that's it. Let's have prayer together. Let's stand, have prayer together, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for Grace Baptist Church who has a mind of missions uh, in, their, in their daily life. It's in our budget, it's in our function, it's what we think about, it's what we do. Lord, thank you that we have people that have a heart for the world and not just for ourselves. Father, thank you for our mission team that uh, backed us up on this trip. That was uh, wonderful. And Father, we pray for the the trip to uh, Maranatha Baptist Church is coming up, Lord. May our people decide they can do this. They can go. They can be a part of this. They can, they can have an enjoyable, wonderful time. Father, we just thank you for our church. We thank you for each one of us, Lord, that you've placed us here. And, and uh, the wonderful thing, Lord, is it's obvious we love each other. And we thank you, Lord, for that, that opportunity. Father, be with us today now as we leave this place. And may we rejoice at being able to be in your house this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.